screen with everyone. Does that look right? Can you see yeah, the presentation? Yeah, that's good for us, yeah. Brilliant. Great. So, um, so hi, everybody. My name's Pip. Um, I work on the Shifting Sands project, which is a Back from the Brink project that's based in Breckland, East Anglia. Um, some of you may have attended Sharon's talk a couple of weeks ago, who is one of our partners. Um, she did a talk on the importance of bare ground for Brex butterflies and moths. So if you were there, a couple of these slides will be, will be pretty familiar to you. But um, yeah, for those that weren't, please just, just stick with it. Um, so the Shifting Sands project is one of 19 projects that make up the National Back from the Brink programme. Um, Again, if you're regularly attending these talks, you will have seen some of the other projects um, and heard about some of the other species. But yeah, we're, we're based in Breckland. We are a, a partnership of 12 conservation organisations all working together um, to secure a future for the Brex. So um, the next slide. Oh, isn't coming up. That's fun. There we go. Um, the next slide is just a map that shows you um, the scale of the project. So um, we're based all around the UK. Some of those are single species projects that focus on just one plant or animal. And um, some of them are more landscape scale conservation projects. And uh, yeah, that's what we are. So we're, um, we're one of the integrated projects focusing on targeting loads of different species through habitat restoration and habitat management work. Um, we're funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, much of the info that I'm going to go through in this talk is, is about Brex habitats, um, but it does relate to semi-natural habitats in general in the UK. So grassland, heathland and parkland. Um, this is just a slide just showing what we're going to run through today. I'm going to be whizzing through some of these slides because it's quite a long presentation and we haven't got that much time. So um, apologies if I am just rambling at you. Um, so we're going to go through a bit of an intro to Breckland and to semi-natural habitats in general, um, the role of keystone species and the rare habitats in the Brex and some of our rare species that rely on stone species. And then we're going to chart decline um, and a little bit more just about the project in general. Um, that'll make more sense as we go through. So to start with, I'm just going to throw some stats at you. Um, I promise I won't be doing this the whole time, but um, I thought it's a good way to highlight what is so special about Breckland. Um, so the area of Breckland is, it's a biogeographical region. So it spans much of Norfolk and Suffolk and a tiny little corner of Cambridgeshire. Um, this map here shows you the sort of vague outline of, of where Breckland is. Um, so it's quite a small area of the UK, but it is a biodiversity hotspot. So it is home to nearly 13,000 species. There are 55 sites of special scientific interest or triple SIs within the Brex. 28% of all UK priority species live there and 72 species within the UK are restricted to the Brex. Um, so what is it about the Brex that makes it so unique? Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a combination of the climate, of the soil type and of the historic land use um, that make it a really special habitat and mean that there's these species that live there that live nowhere else in the country or in some cases nowhere else on earth. Um, so the climate is quite extreme. Um, it's the hottest and driest region in the UK. The weather kind of goes to both extremes. So it gets very, very hot in the summer and it gets very cold during the winter. Um, sometimes it does both at once. So um, you get in the Breck something called summer frosts. You get a, a, a warm summer's day and then you get a frost overnight. Um, so it is a bit of a, a mad place when it comes to climate. It's a very low, very flat lowland landscape, um, which was shaped by glaciers in the last ice age, so around 10,000 years ago. Um, and those glaciers also are responsible for the soil type in the Brex. So there's a really unique 
type of soil in the Brex where there's lines of sand and lines of chalk right next to each other. So we've got a, a photo here that we got on one of our uh, drone survey earlier this year. So this is an area of land that had been recently ploughed, um, recently disturbed for conservation purposes. And you can see there really clearly those lines of chalk and those lines of sand, um, which have been rearranged since the last ice age by periglacial frosts and deposited in these lines. So it's a really rare thing to have such defined soil types on such a fine scale. Um, it means that in the Brex you get typical acid grassland species growing right next to um, some calcareous grassland species, some chalk species. So it is a bit of a mad place for botanists. Um, and it's one of the main reasons that there's such a high biodiversity within the Brex. So I'm going to just run through a bit of the socioeconomic history of the Brex, um, as well as the natural history of the Brex and, and what makes it such a special place for wildlife. Um, this picture that you can see here is, is a very typical Breckland landscape. So the Brex is made up of open habitats, heathland and grassland habitats. The soil is very low nutrient. Um, it's what we would call an early successional habitat. Um, so succession um, is the word that we use as ecologists to describe um, the different stages of life between there being just bare earth and between there being like an ancient woodland. Um, it's where plant communities successively give way to one another. It's all of those different stages. So an early successional habitat is one that is, is more towards the bare earth side of that. It's a sparse habitat. Um, it's, it's open and it's got those patches of bare earth. Um, so what that means is it supports a very different range of species. It supports early successional plants, mosses and lichens, that importantly are of low competitive ability. Um, so what that means is these species are really stress tolerant. Um, they're very good at dealing with droughts and they're very good at dealing with stresses, but they need sparse, low vegetation and they need bare ground. So they're incredibly rare and they can thrive in really tough conditions but they're really easily outcompeted um, by more common species like nettles or like coarser grasses, which grow up really quickly. As soon as those conditions change and they can survive there, they outcompete those rarer early successional species. Um, so basically, we need these early successional conditions for these species to survive. The Brex is very much a man-made landscape. Um, so it was around 6,000 years ago, um, Neolithic times when the Brex was cleared of trees and that was for flint mining. Um, some, some of you may have been to Grimes Graves, which is a really wonderful example of a flint mine within the Brex. Um, and it was for livestock grazing. So traditional land use practices like droving sheep across the heaths. Um, that is what maintained those early successional conditions until very recently. Recently, what we've seen is, is a huge change in how the land is used. So with the discovery or invention of industrial fertilization, um, you could now grow crops on this land. So it went from being a very low nutrient area where it was really only good for grazing um, to being somewhere where you could plough up the heath and you could grow crops and make a bit more money instead. Um, and also it became suitable for agroforestry. So Fetford Forest is actually quite a new addition to the Brex. Um, I think it was planted after the First World War um, for timber resources. And it's this agriculture and forestry that's uh, fragmented the habitats. Um, another big problem though is is nitrogen deposition. So these early successional conditions rely on those low nutrient soils and the activities of people are changing the biogeochemical cycles. Um, so the nutrient cycles that have been occurring for the last few thousands of years are being changed by us, particularly our use of, uh, of transport. So um, using private cars and using um, 
plains. So a lot of the area within the Brex is, um, is around air bases. There's, there's quite a lot of RAF bases and US Air Force bases with a lot of planes going overhead. Um, and yeah, nitrogen gets deposited onto heaths basically from the atmosphere as a result of, of humanity. Um, so what we've seen over the last um, 100 years or so is that grass heath habitats have declined by 76% within the Brex and 25 Breckland species have gone nationally extinct. So the key thing about early successional habitats is that they need maintenance somehow. So in some places that could be wildfires, um, it could be that just water availability is maintained in those early successional conditions, or in the case of the Brex, it could be that a keystone species is maintaining those conditions. So what is a keystone species? Um, I'm just going to take a drink. So the definition of a keystone species is a species that is critical to the functioning of the ecosystem that affects the survival and abundance of many other species. So basically it is a species that has a huge impact on the environment around it and that shapes the landscape. Um, the best or the most famous and well-known example of a keystone species, I think, is the, um, the wolves at Yellowstone National Park. So this is a, a case study that many of you may have heard of. Um, basically, wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park with the intention of bringing down some of the herbivore numbers, reducing the number of deer. But the impact that they had was massive. It was way beyond that. So um, what happened was when the wolves were reintroduced, they did decrease those herbivore numbers. But what they also did was change the behavior of the deer. So that was something that wasn't really anticipated. So um, deer would no longer go down gorges or would no longer enter valleys or would no longer go anywhere where they could be trapped by wolves. So it changed the distribution of other species as well, which in turn meant that forests returned to the areas where the deer weren't visiting. Um, river banks were stabilized by the trees, different species returned like different birds and beavers that needed those trees. And in turn, they changed the hydrology, hydrology of the area. So damming up those rivers, so lakes and ponds returned, which meant different species of fish and amphibians returned. Um, so basically, it's a great case to be in this, this idea that one species can have a huge impact on everything else that lives there. So um, back to grass heath habitats and the Brex, our version of a keystone species is rabbits. Um, slightly less cool poster boy. I, um, I have been trying to get the wolves of the Brex to catch on, but um, it is not so far. So, um, so rabbits play a really important role in, in semi-natural habitats in the UK. Um, they've got a really complex dual role there. So there's often a quite strong public perception uh, that rabbits are very damaging to ecosystems. Um, they certainly are damaging to crops, so they, they are a pest species, but they also play a really important role benefiting different semi-natural habitats. So they were introduced by the Normans in 1066. Um, they are a non-native species. They're native to the Iberian Peninsula, to Portugal and Spain. But very importantly, they're not an invasive species. So there's an important distinction between being non-native and being invasive. So when rabbits were introduced, they filled an ecological niche that was open. Um, they, they don't have any competitors in the way that they do in other places in Europe. They don't compete with ground squirrels or marmots or anything like that. Um, in fact, they, they replaced a niche that we had opened by hunting other species to extinction. So wild boar and wild ponies, um, other herbivores were no longer around and it meant that rabbits filled that role. Um, within the Brex, they have a really important history. Um, so socioeconomically, rabbits are a really key part of, of Breckland's history. 
um, because of that low nutrient soil, because of all of the reasons I mentioned earlier, the sandy and the chalky soil, um, nothing could really grow there. So what they did instead was they farmed rabbits um, for meat and for fur. Hundreds of years, rabbits were farmed extremely intensively within the brecks. Um, they used to be known as the land of the rabbit. And it was very well known that you couldn't ride horse over the brecks because the warrens would just collapse beneath you. There were so many warrens that the ground wasn't stable. Um, it actually got to this age where within the brecks, the ecosystem at one point was mobile sand dunes, um, inland dunes, which is, is pretty amazing. There's, there's stories about mobile sand dunes and sandstorms burying towns in the brecks. Um, only I think in the, in the 17th or 18th century. Um, so there is an amazing history of, of rabbit farming there. It's where the wealth of the Brecks came from. It's where a lot of the towns were formed. Um, and they continue to shape the landscape now through um, two key roles. So the two things that they do, number one is grazing. They are very, very successful grazers. They graze very closely to the ground, so they leave those patches of bare earth. Um, but importantly, they're also really selective grazers, which I think is something a lot of people don't realize. They don't eat everything. They are pretty selective with what they eat. Um, and then also they are ground disturbers. So when they're burrowing and building their warrens, they do a lot of digging um, and they disturb the ground. So they play some pretty important roles. Um, with the grazing that controls those competitive nitrophilus plant species. So, um, so those nettles and thistles and, and long grasses, the things that grow up really quickly and smother all the other species. Um, they create a complex mosaic of sward heights. So because they are selective in their grazing, they don't just do a blanket bare earth everywhere. They create some patches of bare earth, some longer sort of tussocks, and then they also have group latrines, which means that they fertilize some, some areas um, in a very targeted way and cause longer grasses to grow. So they ca cause a really kind of complex um, structural diversity within our habitat on a micro scale, um, what we call micro topography. And then also they, uh, they aid in that nutrient depletion, which the heaths need. Um, so they remove biomass, they re remove the leaf litter. And the ground disturbance plays a similar role. So um, by digging up earth, um, they create bare ground, which is really important to a lot of Breckland species. We'll go into later which species need bare ground and why. Um, and also it creates that structural diversity. Um, also, they, they excavate the seed bank when they're digging. So some seeds can lie dormant for 80 years in the seed bank before a rabbit digs them up and then they'll germinate. And then also it plays another role in nutrient depletion um, by encouraging nutrient leaching down the soil profile and encouraging uh, nitrogen and things to, to move into the atmosphere from the soil. So in short, they maintain those early successional conditions. Uh, these photos just, I think, really, um, really show the impact that rabbits can have. So this is the same site. This is East Retton Nature Reserve, Norfolk Wildlife Trust site. And it is just looking at one side of the site where you've got high rabbit density versus the other side where you've got a really low rabbit density. Um, I think a lot of people might look at these pictures and think, well, the left looks barren um, and the, the right looks really lush. But actually what you've got on the left here is you've got diversity there. So um, you can't see from this photo, but if you kind of zoom in, that turf is made up of lots of really rare flowering plants, different mosses and lichens, um, and it supports a load of different invertebrates. Um, whereas on the right, that is just one species of grass that is very competitive and has taken over the whole site. So um, there is actually much higher biodiversity within the left photograph. And here's just an example of, of some of our species. So this is by no means um, the only species that benefit from rabbit populations, but these are some of ours that we target within the Shifting Sands project. 
that need those conditions, so that need grazed, open, disturbed conditions. Um, I can run through just a few of um, the roles that they play and why they need those conditions. So, um, so that bare earth, um, particularly the really sandy soil that you get in the brecks, gets really warm really quickly. Um, so it's really great for anything that needs to bask or anything that needs to have warm earth beneath it. So reptiles, adders and lizards need that bare earth for basking and for hunting. Um, the invertebrates that you see here all need bare earth for burrowing and for laying eggs. And also they need that different mosaic that I talked about before. So um, the different mosaic of, of vegetation and different sward heights is needed by different invertebrates at different stages in their life cycles. So they need all of that to be present in one place on a micro scale in order to survive. Um, the plants are examples of, of different plants that need open, grazed and disturbed conditions. And uh, bottom left is the stone curly, which um, is a bit of a, a Brex icon. That's um, one of the rare British birds that has a stronghold within the Brex. And they need the bare earth to lay their eggs on, to incubate the eggs from below. And also they have a really interesting kind of symbiosis with rabbits in that rabbits dig up a lot of flint when they're burrowing. Um, and the flint acts as camouflage for stone curly eggs, um, which is, is pretty amazing when you see it side by side. It's almost impossible to tell what's an egg and what's a bit of flint, um, which is actually where they get their name, stone curly. So why am I, you know, going on about rabbits um, and why do they need our help? So rabbits are actually in quite a lot of trouble. Um, rabbit populations have been declining pretty um, intensely over the last few decades. So this graph here shows you the last hundred years or so. Um, you can see there in 1953, that is the introduction, introduction sorry, of myxomatosis. So a lot of us will be aware of, of myxomatosis and will have seen rabbits with myxomatosis. So it was introduced to the UK as a biological agent designed to reduce rabbit numbers in the 1950s. Um, and it reduced rabbit numbers by 99.9%. .9%. So it really worked. Um, you can see there that in the following decades, a little bit of resilience was, was built up and numbers started going up a little bit, but they've never returned to what they were pre-myxomatosis. Um, and in the 1990s, that drop that you can see there is the introduction of a new virus, a rabbit hemorrhagic viral disease or RHD. Um, so RHD is a, a bit more sinister in that the symptoms aren't, um, aren't clear in the way that they are with myxomatosis. They often don't show any symptoms. Um, infection rates and the time between infection and death is very short. You know, you can be in infected with it and then die within 48 hours. Um, that one, RHD1, that was introduced in the 90s, wasn't too bad. Um, since then, in the 2010s, RHD2 has, has come into play. Um, that's the second strain of the same virus and that one is really nasty so we've seen a real um, drop in rabbit numbers here in the last decade um, and the thing is that now all of these viruses are kind of working together it's not like one comes along and the others disappear so you've got myxomatosis RHD1 and RHD2 all working together at the same time um, so it means that rabbit populations aren't really likely to recover is, is going to be very difficult for them to. And we've consequently seen a decline in the, um, in the quality of Brex grassheath habitats and a decline in the Brex species that need those open heathland and grassland early successional habitats that rabbits maintain. Um, just on a sort of side note, RHD um, has also recently been confirmed to have jumped to hares. Um, which is quite frightening. And myxomatosis has also been confirmed to have jumped to hairs um, within France. So um, 
it is kind of worrying. It's a new virus. There's unconfirmed cases of RHD2 also jumping to other orders, so shrews and insectivores. Um, that's not confirmed, but it's, they just show similar um, deaths, basically. But yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a scary thing. I feel like viruses are at the forefront of, of everyone's minds at the moment, but um, it's it's a big problem. So, what can we do? What can Shifting Sands, the project, do to actually help here? Um, we are focusing mostly on trying to use habitat management methods to encourage existing populations and to build resilience. Um, so if we have a look at the next slide, it just shows an overview of the Shifting Sands project of the work that we do. Um, the rabbit work that I, I lead on is just one out of four work streams that we, we do. So there are four integrated work streams. We work across 17 sites within the Brex and we target 28 different species. And you can see there the amount of partners that are involved in this. It is very much a joint conservation effort between all of the conservation organisations within the Brex. So in terms of the actual work that we're doing to try and encourage rabbit numbers, um, we have implemented some trials um, designed by Professor Diana Bell at the University of East Anglia. Um, she's designed habitat enhancement plots, which it's necessary to understand like a little bit about the social structure within rabbit colonies to, to see why we've gone for these designs. So um, there's quite a strict social structure within rabbit warrants. There is a, a dominant female and a dominant male, and the dominant female will suppress um, the breeding ability of other females within the warren. So basically, these trials focus on trying to encourage females to disperse and to establish new warrens. And that should, in theory, build abundance in rabbits whilst building distribution of rabbits. So by encouraging them to burrow, they'll start their own families and you'll be able to boost numbers and build resilience in the populations there. So the way that we're doing that, um, we can see in this photo, this was um, when we put in our first trial banks. So we break the turf, which just means that thick layer of, of um, grasses, scrape that away to leave bare earth, which is a little bit easier to burrow into. Um, you know, if you make things easier, rabbits are lazy, we're all lazy. If we make it as easy as possible for them to burrow into, then hopefully it'll encourage them to spread. Um, and we put in a bank as well, which um, is, there is evidence that they prefer burrowing into banks rather than flat earth. Um, you know, it reduces flooding, it's south facing, so it gets nice and warm. Um, it's easier to burrow into a, the side of a surface than straight down because you don't have gravity working against you when you're trying to kick sand out. Um, so, and also they act as good invertebrate banks. They have very similar designs to butterfly banks and things that, that people might have seen. So, um, so they're pretty good all round. And you can see here by my, my very um, impressive diagrams. That's just where, um, where we've built brush piles. So in the absence of rabbits, uh, you get a lot of scrub and a lot of trees growing up on the heathland, which need to be removed. Um, and what we're trialing is using that scrub to create a brush pile, which acts as a kind of predator refuge. So um, gives some cover to rabbits so they can burrow beneath it and they can pop up without, you know, going straight into a, a fox's face. Um, so they seem to like those, they, somewhere, to, somewhere to hide. Um, we did have some issues with the banks and with the brush piles in that livestock absolutely love them. I think it's just fun and exciting. So they, um, they, they pull them apart and they climb all over the banks. Um, and there's been quite a lot of burrows collapsed on the sites with a lot of livestock. Um, I mean, livestock were kind of introduced to, to Brex sites um, to manage them in the absence of rabbits but are very much a very key part of, of managing Breckland sites. So we need to work out a way to encourage livestock grazing and rabbit grazing alongside each other. 
this, this photo just shows one of our brush piles in action. You see a couple of rabbits there in front of it. Um, so the, there was a little delay, uh, a bit of a delay between the start of the project and actually getting the rabbit works in place. Um, that's due to the area's got very, very sensitive archaeology and also unexploded ordnance. So it makes doing groundworks quite difficult. We need to um, obviously get somebody to have a look at all of the archaeology and all of the chants that you're going to plough off a bomb. Um, so when we did get them in place, we decided to put in a lot of different monitoring methods to try and get as much data as possible. So we do an annual Warren census, um, dusk counts, paw scrape surveys, which is rabbits do little paw scrapes to mark their territory and to dig for roots and things. So it's quite a good proxy for activity. Um, we've got vegetation and invertebrate plots of each survey of, um, sorry, vegetation and invertebrate surveys of each plot even. Uh, drone photographs to assess bare ground coverage, measuring ground penetrability. We've got camera traps and things like that up as well. Um, so we work with volunteers and students from the University of East Anglia who take a lot of the data. And the aim at the end is to produce an advice toolkit for landowners um, on how to boost their rabbit numbers. So it is within the interest of most landowners to do that because maintaining those conditions mechanically is quite expensive if you have to mow and, and disturb the ground so that you're um, maintaining your triple SIs it ends up costing quite a lot. But if you can boost rabbit numbers, it's cheaper and it's simpler and it's a self-sustaining way of doing that. Um, so that is pretty much all I've got to say on, on the rabbit works. Um, I have got a couple of slides just running through other um, parts of the Shifting Sands project, just explaining those ones a little bit. Um, so we also do forest corridors work, which is widening wildlife corridors corridors in Thetford Forest. Um, that's to fragment those open habitats, sorry, to connect those open habitats that have been fragmented by the forest. Um, it's also really good for, for birds that like tree lines, so woodlark and nightjar. Um, this picture was taken this month after works were finished um, in winter spring this year so it's already looking really good you can see there's bare earth and there's sort of a mosaic of different sward heights there and different flowers there's also the rare plants and beetles work um, which focuses on a load of different species but the two key ones are the prostrate perennial narwhal plant um, it has a terrible name but it's a very cool little plant so um, this is another one that needs open habitats and disturbed ground and this is one of the ones that exists nowhere else on the planet. So it's only found on three sites globally and they are all within the Brex. And then the other species that the plant work stream led by plant life focuses on is um, field wormwood or Breckland wormwood and the associated beetle. So the wormwood moonshine beetle is found again only in the Brex and it's found feeding on the Breckland wormwood plants um, at night in winter. It is a beautiful little beetle. Um, its name Moonshine comes because it, it shines um, in the moonlight. And um, those plants are mostly found on, on industrial estates and in housing estates within the Brex. Um, so it's a really cool thing to have right in the doorstep. And then outreach. So all of our work is only done thanks to the help of volunteers. Um, so they take a lot of our data for us. The Breckland Flora Group particularly do a lot of the plant work. Butterfly conservation volunteers and bug life volunteers take a lot of our data and then volunteers for Natural England and for UEA and volunteer archaeologists as well. So we really rely on, on volunteers for a lot of our work. It's really sort of a, a community project. And that's everything I've got. I just thought I'd include this photo at the end. This is, this is one of our photos from a, from a drone survey and it's, it's just a nice... Um, a nice image of you can see all the black dots and lines and things there are rabbit warrens and all of this coarse grass in the bottom right is the longer grasses so um, you can see the difference between like the vibrant vegetation that surrounds rabbit warrens as opposed to that single species that's kind of encroaching on the site there um, so it just highlights the point <laughs> cool i think that's it thank you Thank <laughs> you.
Brilliant. Thank you very much for that tip. That was great. We've got lots of questions in the chat already. So I'm going to dive straight in if that's okay. And if anyone else has got any questions, please send them in the chat, send them to me. Or you can raise your hand as we went over before. Okay, so um, we had a couple of questions basically saying, if rabbits are not native, presumably other species used to keep the brecks in the early successional state. Should we be aiming to reintroduce some of those species and what species would they have been? So on a sort of nation, national scale, um, it would be like a species like wild boar and species like wild ponies that would um, act as sort of ground disturbers and act as grazers. Um, but actually in the Brex, as I mentioned, it's very much a man-made landscape. So since it was cleared 6,000 years ago, it's been managed by people. It's, um, it's been through livestock droving and through felling, but it's been maintained as an open habitat. But now it supports those really rare species that are found nowhere else. So it does maintain constant input from people. There's no other species that can create the same conditions that rabbits create. So um, kind of separately together, I guess moles do a little bit of, of that ground disturbance, not to the same scale. Um, and other species could graze, but there is no species that, that does it as, that grazes as closely or creates those same conditions that rabbits do. Well, thank you. Um, someone was asking, what is the difference between the ecological niches of rabbits and hares? Um, they actually play quite different roles, despite being in the same um, lagomorph family. So rabbits eat around 10 times more than hares um, in terms of grazing. So for every one blade of grass grazed by a hare, there's 10 grazed by rabbits. So they're much more intensive grazers. Um, hares also don't live in burrows, so they don't do the ground disturbance. Um, hares live above ground and they um, have their young in something called a form, which is that they, they uh, sort of, yeah, have their young above ground, which again is why they're, they're in so much risk of, um, from things like agriculture, because if you have your babies on a field, when they come to plough that field, you're going to be in trouble. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there's quite a distinct difference between their ecological roles. Um, there is actually something I, I meant to mention though, which is that Pro Professor Diana Bell, who, um, who I mentioned, who is our advisor for our rabbit work, has been doing work um, on hares over the last year. There's been quite a big decline in hares and she's doing research on that. And it's a citizen science project um, relying on people reporting sightings of dead hares so if you are on a walk, wherever you are in the country, if you're finding dead hares, it would be really helpful if you can report it to the Diana Bell. Um, she, she really um, could do with having, just knowing where it was, particularly if you can get a GPS location on your phone. Sometimes she comes and collects them because it's useful to have samples to test to see if myxomatosis and rabbit hemorrhagic disease are the reason that they've died. Um, but yeah, hopefully, I think Holly can send around um, Diana's contact details after this. Yeah, I will do. Yeah, thanks. Um, someone else is asking, do rabbits play a role as landscape engineers in any other regions in the UK? So pretty much, yeah, any um, semi-natural parkland or heathland habitats um, will benefit from having rabbits there particularly areas that I always get contacted about are Salisbury Plains, which is the other big one where they really rely on rabbits. Um, and again, are having the same problems because it's a nationwide issue that, that their rabbit numbers are declining and it's getting very overgrown. Thank you. Uh, Miriam was asking, was RHD1 intentionally introduced and is RHD2 a mutation of that? That's a good question. I. I actually meant to look into this earlier because I couldn't remember. Off the top of my head, I think it was another intentional one. It was, um, I know that it came from Chinese domesticated rabbit farms. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm gonna have to Google it and put it in the, uh, <laughs> the follow-up email. Yeah, you can do that, no worries, thank you. Um, Stephen is asking, is there a suggestion that the introduction of rabbits may have pushed out voles from habitats? Oh, I haven't, I haven't heard that. Um, 
everything that I have um, read and, and learned through this is that the introduction was fairly benign for all other species, although obviously they will have a, everything plays a role with every other species. But um, no, I haven't heard about that. I'll have to look into that. Right, thank you. Um, oh, a big question here. Uh, would Brex be a suitable area for lynx reintroduction? Uh, I, do you know what? When I was out surveying, doing the drone surveys this year, um, I was told to look out because there have been five lynx sightings in one week um, around Lackford Lakes Nature Reserve, which I would love to be true, but I think it's probably um, a big cat because um, my, my colleague Ezra did, did the calculations on it. So lynx need areas of forest um, to hunt. They're not very good at hunting out in the open. They need trees. And Thetford Forest is basically not big enough. So they have massive, massive territories. So Thetford Forest could support about 1.4 lynx. So unfortunately not. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, Gray was asking, are there any immunisation attempts to help these rabbit viruses? Yeah, so that was one of the original plans was to maybe do some rabbit reintroductions and immunise them. Um, the problem with it is that the immunisation doesn't last very long at all. So um, rabbits do actually recover from, rabbits that recover from myxomatosis are immunised and they pass that on to their young, but only for the first six weeks of their life. Um, so a lot more rabbits survive myxomatosis than we first thought. Um, so that's a good point. If a lot, I think a lot of people see a rabbit with myxy and they think I should put this out of its misery. It's, it's doing pretty badly, but actually quite a lot of them do recover and then have immunization. So it's worth just leaving them. Um, and with RHD as well, there are immunizations that you can do, but it only lasts about a year once you've, um, vaccinated them so it's it's barely worth putting the money in to be honest yeah thank you tony is asking given their potential harm to crops how tolerant are landowners of efforts to encourage rabbit populations um i found actually that landowners and farmers in the brex are extremely on board with um with our conservation work so at the, at the numbers that rabbits are at now, they really don't pose any, um, any problem to, to crops. I think all the culling and the shooting that, that still does go on, it goes on more out of habit than necessity at the moment. Um, but like I mentioned, I mean, it is in, it's in the interest of landowners to encourage their rabbit populations because so much of the Brex is designated land. It's triple SI land that you need to maintain in favorable condition. So you can either do that by paying to go and mow it and plow it regularly, or you can get that done for free if you boost rabbit numbers and, and you can put up rabbit proof fencing, which works out cheaper. Great, thank you. Uh, Lawrence was asking, you mentioned that the Brex is a really dry area. Is it considered a desert? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think it is quite there is um there is the least rainfall in the uk but it is still you know in the uk so it, it isn't um but actually i was just thinking about it this morning i was out surveying um and it is very hot at the moment but it's a really good thing for for brex habitats when it gets this hot actually because like i mentioned a lot of the species are really stress tolerant and really drought tolerant but the grasses aren't so they'll die off and it'll leave space for these these species that um, are really not competitive, but very stress tolerant. Yeah. Um, Stephen was asking, you showed those two pictures before of one area with rabbits and one with a sort of lower density, that, which had been taken over by a grass species. He was just wondering, do you know what that grass species is, that dominant one? I don't, unfortunately. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry. Um, Someone was asking, do you have any evidence yet that the scrapes are being used by the rabbits and is it increasing the numbers of burrows and breeding at all? So it's, um, it's really difficult to say. The, the, the thing with um, this project is it's a three year project and rabbit numbers fluctuate so much over such long time scales. It's going to be quite tough to say whether it's actually had an effect on, on the population. Um, they are being used. So 
particularly uh, more on more on some sites than others. It seems to be really site specific. Um, but one of our sites, we've had like I think it's 18 boroughs that have formed and have then been inhabited, which is really brilliant on those scraped areas. But then 16 of those have then been collapsed by livestock. So it's it's really difficult um, <laughs> to know how to get that balance between needing to graze with livestock and boost rabbit numbers. The thing that seems to be working best at the moment is the brash piles. Um, those burrows have formed more within the brash piles and have stayed there because they haven't been collapsed. Um, but none of this is statistically significant yet. So we're collecting a lot of data and then at the end of the project, we'll, we'll work with the University of East Anglia to do some analysis and see what is statistically working. <laughs> Great. That's great, thank you. Sorry, I keep muting myself because there's thunder going on outside. So sorry if you can't hear me or if I cut out. Um, David was saying he's working on a scheme to encourage acid lowland grassland in high weald East Sussex. Uh, and he's finding that rabbits are eating the new plants to low turf, which appears to be suppressing some species such as knapweed. Is there a conflict of interest there or will the rabbit prove to be beneficial sort of in the long term? It's absolutely part of that complex dual role of rabbits um, but some of our target species as well don't like being grazed um, so field wormwood does not benefit from being grazed in the way that it would with rabbits there so it is just finding that that balance that's kind of the fun and horribly complex thing about finding the balance in ecosystems <laughs> in that, you know, it will benefit some species and it may well harm others. Um, yeah, there's, it's difficult to find the balance there. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, Jenny was just asking, how long do rabbits live for? Um, so in the wild, they can live um, about nine, 10 years, um, but rare that they do at the moment. I think most of the young actually die um, die within their first year. So, so there is a really common misconception that rabbits breed like rabbits and are very good at having babies. But um, actually all of the, uh, the data that we use when we talk about the size of rabbit litters is from domesticated rabbits, which have been specifically selectively bred to have as many babies as possible. So rabbits in the wild actually generally only have about one young that survives to adulthood. Um, so their, their mortality rate is, is pretty bad, <laughs> even but without all these diseases. Yeah, thank you. Um, bear with me a second, there's a few questions come in. Oh, so there's a comment from Tony just saying that the RHD virus strains appear to have evolved out of China initially and Europe subsequently and migratory birds and insects are thought to be the vectors spreading that around. Um, and then Stephen asked, is it a myth that some rabbits have uh, genetic immunity to myxomatosis? Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's that. Um, they certainly do build immunity over time, um, as is, is shown by that, that graph that shows them slowly recovering. Um, so they do, no, that, that isn't a myth. They do build, they do build immunity um, and they build immunity as well to RHD1 and they hopefully will to RHD2. It's just with those three viruses then working in conjunction with each other, it's still going to be quite difficult for numbers to recover even if they do slowly build immunity. Thank you. Um, Tony was also saying that grow nesting bees and wasps need this uh, disturbed habitat are there any other notable, uh, notable hymenopterans, so bee and wasp species, that these habitats are benefiting that you know of? I am a bit rubbish with them, to be honest. The only, the only one of our target species that is, um, is a ground nesting wasp is the five-banded five tailed weevil wasp. Um, but there are certainly loads of solitary bees and solitary wasps that need that bare ground. Um, and there's some wonderful um, wonderful examples if you can take the time to go to Thetford Forest um, there are some beautiful areas that are just full of holes of these solitary bees nesting. Well thank you. Right I think I've got to the bottom of 
all of the questions. We've got a couple more minutes. If anyone's got another question, send it now and I'll uh, try and read that out. I'm just going to have a quick scan back through the chat just to make sure I haven't missed anything. There's been quite a few. Oh, and I want to come in. Uh, so Lawrence was asking um, when you were talking about how long rabbits lived for, just before, um, is that to say that rabbits only have one surviving young on average in their lifetimes? No, that's once per year um, that one generally survives into adulthood. That's based on a study done at, at UEA on their, um, their rabbits that live on campus. So um, it's difficult to say in, in general world populations, but it's certainly way less than we thought survived to adulthood. Yeah, yeah, I was really that as well. Right, I think that's all the questions. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, Pip. And thank you everyone else for joining us as well. It's a very uh, hot evening, so thanks for bearing with us. Um, I'll send around those contact details Pip mentioned earlier about dead hairs in the follow-up email. And I'll send around the recording as well. Um, yeah, so that's it everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight and hopefully Hopefully I'll see you all soon. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, please feel free to unmute yourselves and say goodbye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.